Hello, everyone. We're ready for a CCO student webinar. It's number 96. Excellent topic that we have for our students tonight. I know that it gets confusing when you start looking up how to code for hernias and hernia repairs. We're going to just look at the CPT codes. We're not going to look at the ICD tonight. And uh, I know that kind of breaks my heart. You know how much I love the ICD component. But hernia repairs is not only a very common procedure, it is also commonly used for testing purposes. So I want to make sure that you have a really valuable understanding of what's necessary to code for these repairs so that when you get to that section of your test or when you get out there in the real world, you are able to uh, look at these hernia repair scenarios with confidence, you know, what to abstract for and getting to the highest specificity quickly. So let's break down a couple of things that we need to know about hernias. The first thing is that once a person develops a hernia, there is no cure other than it being surgically repaired. Now, that doesn't mean that the repair has to be done immediately. It is true that some people go quite a long time without having a repair done. However, eventually, from what I understand and what I see in documentation, it becomes a problem eventually. Not only uh, can it uh, cause uh, infection, strangulation, incarceration, some other things that we're talking about. It's just downright uncomfortable to have. And there's little devices that people can use and, and ways to, to keep that abdominal wall pressure on that so that the herniation doesn't poke through. But needless to say that uh, there is no cure. Once it's developed, it will eventually need to be repaired. Groin hernias, by the way, are actually pretty common disorders. And um, there's a lot of variation to groin uh, uh, hernias. And it, age is important when we look at doing repairs. They can be really difficult to diagnose. Uh, there's a lot of uh, testing that has to be done when you're dealing with groin hernias. And sometimes uh, what they will find out is they may be going in to do another procedure or they're looking at another hernia and then they see that there's also a uh, another hernia you know where they thought there was one there was multiple or there was a groin hernia when they didn't realize that that was there it might be an inguinal or another type that being said, be very, very mindful of when you look at the pre-op and the post-op diagnoses. They could be different. Always pay attention to that. We don't want that to um, uh, be overlooked. And you go in there thinking that there's one hernia or maybe even two that they're going to go in and do a repair. And, and in fact, there's another one listed and uh, done in the repair. At the end of this presentation, the very last slide, I've got a fabulous image of uh, a surgery being done and then putting the mesh in. So uh, staying tuned to that. If that type of thing makes you a little squeamish. <laughs> Uh, be prepared. It is the last slide. I always like using images when possible. It helps us understand the coding process, right? When we can actually see what's being done, it makes a little more sense to us. This is what a herniation looks like. Uh, it A hernia pokes through the abdominal wall or the fascia. And again, most of the time it can be reducible and it can be pushed back. Uh, but eventually, it isn't. Now, how do we determine uh, what type of hernia that the patient has? The first thing that we look at is location. Where's the hernia located? The inguinal or on the inner groin hernia, you'll see that right here. Uh, it's at the opening of the inguinal canal, uh, canal. And I don't have my uh, glasses on, I guess I probably should put those on so I can see that just a tad bit better. All right, so we have the, oh yes, there we go. Uh, and this is showing an indirect in, uh, inguinal, one at the inguinal canal. Uh, then we can also have femoral or outer groin over here. Notice that almost 
looks like it's the top of the uh, where the femoral artery would be. That's why it's named that. At the top, maybe where the femur is, that it's all locational. Another reason why I think it's very important to learn the bones. You hear me say that all the time. This occurs uh, right there at the femoral canal. And then we have an incisional, which is uh, a direct result of uh, having had a procedure done or incision here, they're showing a uh, example up higher, but it could actually be anywhere uh, on the abdomen, but it is a result of having had a surgery. And then when they, they cut into the abdominal wall, it weakened and it didn't maybe heal um, adequately on the inside like it did on the outside and it weakened that area and then uh, part of the intestine can can pull through. And then we have umbilical, which is pretty easy to understand. It's where the um, your belly button is. Your umbilical cord was attached there. And then the hiatal hernia is at the upper part of the stomach. Uh, there's also, uh, also you can have an epigastric or upper abdominal at the midline. Uh, there's an also one called a direct inguinal, and that's near the opening of the, um, the inguinal canal. And notice this is indirect and that's direct. You don't have to have these memorized. However, be very aware of the fact that we have different locations and that's how we're going to determine uh, what type of hernia it is as far as you know um, the location of the body. Next let's get some verbiage under our belt before we start looking at the codes. Terms that you want to abstract from the scenario or the documentation that you're given from the provider is things like initial recurrent, reducible, incarcerated, and strangulated. Those are going to be main terms that are, will uh, uh, put you in the right direction of proper coding, which again, we're going to look at these codes in a moment. If we have initial, that means the initial uh, encounter uh, to take care of that hernia. Uh, recurrent means that it's happened before. Pretty straightforward. Reducible just means they can poke it back in place. So think of this little area right here, which looks like it's, well, that's pretty, um, uh, that's actually strangled, strangulated. But if it's just a little bit on that previous slide, they did, if you can push it back into place, then that's called reducible. Once it's no longer able to be reduced or put back, then you have the um, uh, next step would, would be incarcerated, and then it can be strangulated. And we notice here that we have the hernia defect right there, and then the strangulation is where that intestine becomes twisted, and it will cut off blood supply. If that happens, not only is it painful, but you can have death of that tissue. And it doesn't repair itself. It's like um, the the brain. It gets well. Okay, don't let me not say that specifically. Your intestinal tissue is not like the heart and the brain. That when there's an uh, an infarction, uh, blockage of the blood vessels and stuff, that it cannot um, uh, repair itself. That it's a little bit different. However, what what is different though is that think about the contents of the intestines. Uh, if we close off circulation and it gets strangulated, then um, it's going to get infected. It's going to lose the blood supply. Uh, what grows in a warm, moist, dark uh, spot? You know, next thing you know, you could have gangrene. And then you would have, uh, uh, you could have death because of this, but not only death of the tissue, it could be necrotic, and then they have to go in and put in a stoma, and you have a colostomy possibly, or wherever it is located at where the strangulation occurs, but, um, you know, there's no coming back from that. They would have to go in and do an anastomosis eventually, and we're talking about a long journey of repairing and, and healing that um, particular area, but people do die of this. Uh, I've seen autopsy uh, uh, actual autopsy 
uh, images and stuff of people who have died from these hernias that have gotten strangulated and they um, didn't have it repaired for whatever reason and the person became septic and died. We are going to also look at the codes before we do and uh, note that uh, there are more slides to come, but the one of the advantages of our students is that we have uh, the ability to, to give you our CCO club and we want to encourage you to join our CCO club. It's the uh, going to allow you to get the full recording. Uh, our student webinars are pulled down. We may let you see them, but uh, you won't get to see the entire thing because it's an exclusive product for our students in our CCO club. And um, this entire webinar will be located in the uh, CCO club along with the slide deck. You get access to that transcript and the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. The CCO club also includes CEUs to help you stay certified. And it's real easy to join the CCO club. You just go to cco.us forward slash club. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know about it.